I want to talk today about two more types of nuclear reactions. The first type of reaction that I want to look at today that causes transmutation of one element to the other, just like radioactivity does, except in a different way, is called nuclear fission. Nuclear fission is a process whereby one heavy nucleus one heavy nucleus splits into two or more lighter nuclei. Now, in the process of doing that, it releases energy. We'll talk about where that energy comes from in a little while. There's an example of it listed on the board. This is not the only example of a fission reaction that you could see, not even close. There's tons of reactions, tons of examples of it. Although this is a very, very common example of it, you probably will see this one again because it's so common. It's certainly not the only one. You can see here in this example that there is one heavy nucleus on the left side and two lighter nuclei on the right side. There's also some neutrons in here. There's also some energy in there. And all that stuff's really, really important. But what we want to look at in determining what type of reaction we have in establishing that this is a fission reaction is not so much the neutrons that we have and the energy that we have, but rather it's this and this. One heavy nucleus becomes two lighter nuclei. Now, how does this happen? How does this, how do we make this happen? And this is one that we can make happen. Okay, this is one that can be forced to happen in a power plant. This is one, not this specific one in a power plant, but this type of reaction can be forced to happen in a power plant. Um, it can be forced to happen to cause a massive explosion, i.e. a nuclear bomb. Okay, we can make this happen. And we make this happen by taking something that is slightly unstable, like uranium-235, and making it more unstable by smashing something into it. It's kind of like, it's kind of like um, you got this big, massive iceberg in the North Atlantic. And like you're nearby it and you hear it cracking. Like, and it's like you think it's about to break apart, but it's just not breaking apart. It's not splitting up. So what do you do? You, 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 you get a drunk... Uh, captain of a ship and you steer your big ship into the side of it and then a chunk of this iceberg breaks off here this is this is the titanic this is the iceberg the titanic smashes into the iceberg and it makes the iceberg break apart now it's not quite like a collision like that although we can think of it like that, the reality is what's happening here is this neutron actually, as it, as it gets fired at the uranium-235, as we fire using a neutron gun, literally a gun, into uranium-235, the neutron gets absorbed by uranium-235. It becomes, for a brief time, uranium-236, which will decay on its own to any one of a number of different combinations of nuclei, in this case, krypton and barium-141. And some extra neutrons. We've got to have three extra neutrons on this side in order to balance everything out, right? We're, we'd be missing three from the mass number if there weren't three neutrons produced. And there's also some energy produced that we'll talk about in just a couple of minutes. Now, actually, I'll, I'll briefly talk about that energy now. Not where it comes from, but how much it is. 200 mega electron volts. Sounds like a lot, right? Mega electron, mega. If any, anything has a mega in it, it's big, right? Mega electron volts. But remember, an electron volt is 10 to the minus 19 joules. So a mega electron volt is like 10 to the minus 13 joules. That's not a lot of energy. That energy is enough to move maybe a speck of dust. If this reaction, this reaction could take place inside this classroom and not affect any of us. So how can it blow up a city or power a city? In the case of a power plant, you've got to have lots of them taking place. How do you get lots of them taking place? It's pretty inefficient to fire an exponential number of neutrons at this uranium-235 in order to get a tremendous amount of energy here. 
So what we do is actually take these three neutrons and design your system so that these three neutrons can be absorbed by three more uranium 235s, which will cause three times the energy and then produce nine neutrons and cause nine more reactions, which will produce 27 neutrons, which will produce 27 reactions and then 81 neutrons and so on and so on and so on. Within a fraction of a second, within a fraction of a second, this can grow exponentially to the point where you can take this energy here that was in a single reaction enough to move a speck of dust. It can grow to the point where it releases enough energy to blow up or power a city within a fraction of a second. This was the reaction that was used uh, by the Americans in 1945 when they bombed Hiroshima. Uranium-235 was the fissionable material that was used. Uh, the bomb that was dropped on, on Nagasaki was not uh, the same bomb. It was a plutonium bomb. The, the, the bomb was technically much more difficult to build than the first one, but the fuel, the plutonium, was much, much easier to get. The uranium-235 bomb, the first one that was dropped on Hiroshima, the fuel was unbelievably difficult to get. Uranium is mined from the ground, but the vast majority of uranium that comes out of the ground is not uranium-235, the stuff that's needed for this bomb. So they got to separate it to get the uranium-235 out. They got to they, they got to purify it. They call it enriched uranium. You ever heard of, a, maybe in the context, in the news, in the context of North Korea, maybe, uranium enrichment? Okay. The Americans... The world is concerned because North Korea has a uranium enrichment program where they're, where they're enriching uranium to uranium-235, which makes it a, a, a fissionable bomb, or fissionable material for a bomb. How do they separate it? It's, it's not easy because uranium-235 is chemically identical to uranium-anything else. So you can't separate it by chemical means, which would normally be the easiest way of doing something like that. So you've got to separate it physically. Usually what you use is centrifuge, which spins, spins uranium around, and the, the harder part, the harder, or sorry, the heavier parts of it go to the outside. Sounds easy. But the reality is uh, it took the Americans something like three years. Something, I think it was something like three years to actually get enough uranium-235 to purify it to the point where they could actually use it in a bomb. It was never tested. You know why it was never tested? Because it would take them another three years to get enough uranium to build a bomb. They just trusted that it would work. The reason they didn't drop a second one on Hiroshima or on Nagasaki is because they didn't have enough. Didn't have enough fuel. Got to use a different one. Um, well, then, then, the, then, the, then the world would be a different place, right? If it if it didn't work, for the be for better or worse, the world would be a different place. All right. This is what we call a chain reaction, a chain reaction where the products or the daughter, the products of one reaction cause more reactions, right? We don't, this would not be effective. This would not be efficient. It would not be practical if we had to keep firing uranium, sorry, uh, neutrons at uranium-235. But if we can kickstart it by firing one neutron, we can handle that. And if we design the bomb in such a way, physically design it in such a way that these uranium, sorry, these neutrons will fuse, will come together with more uranium and sustain itself, then, then it's, it's a little bit more efficient, a little bit more practical. Do you know that they had in 1945 when they built this bomb about 50 kilograms of uranium, 235, that's it. Two, three years, 50 kilograms, that's it. That's all they got. In two or three years, and when they when they when they drop that bomb, it uh, it they don't know exactly how much of it exploded, but it's thought that somewhere between three and six kilograms of uranium actually exploded. The rest of, the rest of it just just was wasted. That's nuts. But they they knew that would happen. They knew that would happen. 
the reason only about three to six kilograms exploded, nobody knows exactly how much it was that exploded. But the reason that only that much exploded is because this reaction takes place or this chain reaction takes place so quickly that the energy grows so exponentially quickly that the bomb literally blows itself apart so soon, so quickly that, that you can't have, you can't sustain the reaction, right? The chain reaction dies because these neutrons that are produced can't go together with more uranium because the uranium's not there anymore. The bomb's been blown apart. Go ahead. Oh, that's a good question. It doesn't. It doesn't follow the law of conservation of energy. It follows the law of conservation of mass slash energy, and we'll talk about that in a couple minutes here, okay? Yeah, Connor? Well, not the world, but... Just but but probably a country, yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's take a look at another type of reaction here now. Nuclear fusion is the exact opposite process of fission. If fission was when one nucleus splits apart into two, then fusion is when two nuclei fuse together. Two white nuclei fuse together to make one heavy. So you can see in this case here, we've got, this is not the only example of a fusion reaction, of course, but it's one. It's a good one. It's a common one. Hydrogen 2, which is a heavy isotope of hydrogen, fuses together with another heavy isotope of hydrogen to form helium and a neutron and some energy. But the important thing is not so much right now, at least in identifying the type of reaction, not the neutron and the energy, but rather that we have two things fusing together to form one versus back here when we had one thing breaking up into two lighter nuclei. Now, this one releases less energy in a single reaction than fission, but releases more energy per kilogram than fission. Let me write that down in a little summary sentence here. I'm going to say the um, in one reaction, the energy produced in a fusion reaction is less than the energy released in a fission reaction. But per kilogram, per kilogram of material, the energy released in a fusion reaction is much, much greater than the energy released in a fission reaction. So in other words, if this single reaction takes place with, with two hydrogen nuclei, you're not going to get very much out of it. In fact, quite a bit less than you get out of one single reaction here. But if you take a kilogram of this, and you take a kilogram of, of this, you're going to get way more out of this. So dollar for dollar, pound for pound, kilogram for kilogram, you'll get more out of fusion than you will out of fission, but not in a single reaction. You have to have as much material to get more out of it. Does that make sense? Much greater than. All right. This is difficult to make happen. Really difficult to make happen. Really difficult to make happen. And why? Because hydrogen right here is positively charged. So is this guy. Well, as they're positively charged and they come close enough together to fuse, what do they do? They repel each other. By Coulomb's law, right? We learned way back in unit two, F is equal to KQ1, Q2 over R squared. As R gets smaller, the force of repulsion gets much, much bigger. Greater than, greater than, bigger, yeah. So this force of repulsion becomes so big, you have to overcome that somehow. So you actually have to pump in some energy to kickstart this, to make this happen. The Americans developed a bomb in 1952 called the H-bomb. You ever heard of the H-bomb, the hydrogen bomb? It was a nuclear fusion bomb. It was this reaction. When, we, when, they, when they did that, 
they knew very well that they had to overcome a very, very strong repulsive force, an astronomically strong repulsive force between these nuclei. The way they did it was to use a fission reaction, like essentially a small fission bomb, to generate energy, which in turn would cause the hydrogen to fuse together to form a fusion reaction. Does that make sense? Now, this becomes self-sustaining, or it can become self-sustaining, because some of this energy, not all of it, but some of it can go back into to sustaining itself, right? Not this exact reaction, not this exact example, but a similar reaction is the reaction that takes place in the sun. It's the dominant reaction in the sun. How does the sun sustain itself? Because it's hot. It's a lot of energy. So that energy allows more hydrogen to fuse together, which produces even more energy, which allows more hydrogen to fuse together, which produces even more energy, and so on and so on and so on. Someday the sun's going to run out of hydrogen. Someday. It's going to be a long time, long after we have to worry about it. But someday it's not going to have any hydrogen left. Okay. Now, in both cases, fission and fusion, Maddie asked a question earlier about energy and conservation of energy. In both cases here, it appears as if the law of conservation of energy is not, doesn't hold. And it's true, it doesn't really hold. Um, rather, we should talk about the law of conservation of energy slash mass now, because what happens here is that this energy is generated because some mass disappears. Mass is converted to energy. Einstein said, that energy and mass are two different forms of the same thing. Like ice and steam, kind of, like ice and steam. We convert back and forth. And that's what's happening here. In this reaction and in the fission reaction, a little bit of mass, not very much, but a little bit of mass disappears. But it hasn't been destroyed. It's just been converted to energy. Just like um, you got this big block of ice. Hey, a little bit of ice has disappeared. Well, it's not gone. It's just now liquid water as it's melted. We're not talking about a phase change here like that, but it's, it's analogous to that. So now we're talking about really conservation, conservation of energy slash uh, mass. Okay, last, uh, last thing here, and it's a table that we want to get copied down today. But before you copy it, I want you to just listen to what it, what it says and what it means here. I've got, I've got two definitions in two different contexts. In the context of a single nucleus and in the context of a reaction. Now, the definitions sound uh, a little bit different, but it's one definition that causes the other. It's the definition of mass defect in, a single, in the context of a single nucleus that results in the definition of mass defect for a fission and fusion reaction, which ends up causing the energy release. That'll become a little bit more clear in a second here. Okay, don't write this quite yet. If you have to take a picture at the end of class because you run out of time, then that's what we'll do, okay? Mass defect in the context of a nucleus is the difference in mass between the nucleus and the nucleons. A nucleon is a proton and a neutron. Proton or neutron. So let's say you guys are protons and neutrons. And let's say there's 20 of you in the room. And let's say that each of you has a mass of 50 kilograms. What's the total mass of the room? 1,000 kilograms, right? But it's not. The mass of each one of you is 50, but the mass of the classroom is 999.92 kilograms. There's missing mass. You add up your mass, your mass, your mass, your mass, and your mass. It adds up to 1,000. But if you actually weigh the room, it's 999.92 kilograms. There's some missing mass somewhere. That missing mass is called the mass defect. And that's, kind of, that's wacky right now. It's going to be wacky. Like at the end of Physics 30, this is still going to be wacky. But in just a moment, you're going to understand it just a little bit better, at least. The nucleus weighs less than what makes up the nucleus. Now, in the context of a reaction, what we start with is more mass than what we end with. 
we lose mass in the reaction. That's called the mass defect. Where is that missing mass? Where does it go? Well, it's an energy, energy in both cases. But it manifests itself slightly differently here. We call it binding energy. This binding energy here in the context of a single nucleus is the energy required to disassemble the nucleus. In other words, if everybody's mass combined was 1,000, but the total mass of the room was 999.92, then 0 0.08 kilograms is stored in the form of energy. It's still there, but it's not, ener it's not mass, it's energy. We call it binding energy. Now, this, def this is a, a, a correct, good technical definition, but what I want you to take away from this is not so much the wording that it says here in this, in this little box here. Okay. In the end, when a reaction takes place, in certain cases, energy will end up being lost. Sorry, mass will end up being lost. That mass that's lost is in the form of energy. That's binding energy. I'm going to summarize this in a way that's a little bit easier to understand. I just put this down because that's the way technically we define it. This is more important. It's the energy released in the reaction. Now, how do you find the amount of energy that's released in the reaction? Well, you guys know this. Oh, you guys know this. It's probably the most famous physics equation ever. Maybe the least done. This is the energy that's released in the reaction. This is the mass defect. This is the speed of light squared. So this is what relates energy to mass, just like you could probably come up with an equation that relates. Um, well, you could really come up with an equation that relates um, water to ice, to steam, right? Q equals mc delta T, or Q equals uh, m times the latent heat of the fusion or vaporization or whatever, right? So, this is weird, but in the end here, if we talk about a single nucleus, what makes up the nucleus weighs more than the <coughs> nucleus. The difference in mass is energy. It's still there, but it's just stored differently. In the context of a reaction, Mass is lost. Mass disappears. We, so we start off with a certain amount of mass. We end up with a certain amount of mass that's less. The difference in mass gets released as energy. And in both cases, we can find the energy, the binding energy, here or here, by multiplying the mass defect by the speed of light squared. This is what would give us that, what was it, 200 mega electron volts in that fission example that I gave you? This is what we, we had the mass defect and the speed of light. Do the math, we'd end up with 200 mega electron volts right there. 